What is personality? Is it stable or do we change over time? How accurate are personality tests? And what is the difference between temperament and personality? In today's video, we will define and go over the difference between temperament and personality, as well as how each of these are measured. Even Greek philosophers argued that people fell into some sort of personality groups. Hippocrates, for example, believed that the liquid inside of us determined our personalities. According to his view, someone who had a lot of phlegm might be more passive. Ugh, I hate the word phlegm. Since then, psychologists have continued to explore the question of what makes us who we are. Why? Because understanding traits allow us to predict and understand behavior better. Specifically, psychologists study temperament and personality as a way to understand inter-individual differences and to understand the components, like genetics or the environment, that makes us who we are. When we talk about temperament, we are referring to biologically based individual differences in emotion, motor, reactivity, and self-regulation that demonstrate consistency across situations over time. On the other hand, personality refers to the relatively enduring traits or predispositions that influence our behavior across time and across context. As you can see, temperament places much more emphasis on characteristics being biological because there are clear distinctions in how babies react to novel stimuli, their activity level, and their sociability from very early on, i.e. before they have even had very much experience or environmental influences. Further, the field of personality has had a bit more of a longer history, so the view of what personality is, what contributes to it, and whether it is stable or changing is debated by different theorists, which we will review briefly later in the video. Through a variety of longitudinal studies, researchers have found that temperament influences a child's behavior and the way he or she interacts with others across a the lifespan. Therefore, by understanding temperament, caregivers and researchers can seek to give children a goodness of fit. Goodness of fit means that the temperament meshes well with the environmental properties, the expectations, and the demands of the child's surroundings. When talking about temperament, there are always different ways in which psychologists have grouped behavioral characteristics underlying a particular temperamental profile. One of the first to do this was Thomas and Chess. In their study, Thomas and Chess interviewed parents about their children's behavior. Based on these interviews, they derived three big categories. The first, which was composed of about 10% of the children they interviewed, were difficult children. A difficult child tended to be irritable, had an irregular biological rhythm, meaning that their sleeping and eating habits were very disorganized, and had intense response to new situations. Basically, these parents probably got very little sleep because of the difficult child's temperament. An easy child, which made up about 40% of the children, is kind of what we would all hope to have. Uh, easy child's uh, is generally happy. They have regular biological rhythms, so their sleeping schedule was fairly consistent, and they were really good at accepting new situations, so they were less likely to become irritated. In contrast, the slow to warm up child is your typically shy child. They seem to be a little more reluctant or hesitant in new situations. While Thomas and Chess created a good starting point for temperament researchers, more nuanced categories have been created since their classic study. Rothbart's and Bates extended on Thomas and Chess by fine-tuning some of the temperament profiles. They believe that instead of uh, three broad categories proposed by Thomas and Chess, children's temperament actually differs on seven main dimensions. These include positive affect or approach, which captures the child's sociability, activity level or how much the child moves, fearfulness or the amount of distress or withdrawal shown, anger or frustration or the negative emotions displayed when a child's frustrated, attentional orienting or how long the child can engage in activities, effortful control or their ability to suppress a dominant response, i.e., their level of impulsivity, 
And yeah, that's basically it. Now, how did they get these dimensions? I'm really glad you asked. Researchers have three main ways of capturing temperament profiles in children. First is the parental assessment. In a parental assessment, parents are given a questionnaire aimed to measure temperament dimensions. Based on how parents respond to the questionnaire, children receive a score for a particular dimension, which gives us a temperament profile. With psychophysiological assessments, you can measure uh, physiological states like heart rate or brain activity. So for example, if you were to measure heart rate in a child when they encounter novel situations, you could uh, see how the heart rate response differs from child to child. One idea is that the biological component, besides the genetic component of temperament, may rest in how the central nervous system responds to new scenarios. So children that are inhibited might have a faster heart rate when encountering new circumstances than children who are not inhibited. We can also use fMRI, which measures activation of brain regions when engaging in a particular task or viewing particular images, to probe underlying neural signatures of children with different temperaments. Lastly, we can also have laboratory observations to see how infants engage with and respond to different activities. Jerome Kagan, who is widely known for his research on temperament, showed that children's reaction to new stimuli can determine whether they would be inhibited or more reserved and prone to, to fear or uninhibited or more outgoing and less prone to fear throughout the lifespan. On the whole, the various researchers have different ideas on how to categorize children based on their biological predisposition, but most would tend to agree that temperament can determine how a child will interact with his or her environment, and depending on the stability of the environment, the temperament will likely remain stable over time. Unlike temperament, research in personality seems to have much less of a consensus on where personality comes from. As you will see, different perspectives have radically different explanations as to how we come to develop particular personalities. The psychoanalytic perspective proposes that personality is derived from unconscious motivations such as needs and desires, and this is your typical Freudian uh, theories. The social cognitive perspective, um, or what, my, what some might refer to as the social learning theory, tends to focus on the interaction between biology and the environment. The humanistic perspective focuses on one's inner capacity for growth. And then last, the trait perspective, which seems, to be, which seems to be the most prominent perspective in the field of personality, tries to capture specific dimensions of personality. According to the social cognitive theory, we interpret the environment and what happens to us um, in ways that shape us. So if we are naturally outgoing or extroverted, which would be our genetics, we are more likely to go out and make friends. These experiences are in turn rewarding, which would be a contingency to our behavior. So in turn, we are more likely to go out and try to meet new people. Moreover, our personalities might also be shaped by observing other people. If you remember Bandura, he was a big proponent that children learn by copying the behaviors of other people, and we do know that some habits might come from observing the behavior of others. On the other hand, the humanistic perspective went against the social learning theorists because they didn't think that we were tied to our genetics and environmental influences. Instead, they focused on an individual's ability to reach their full potential. Two of the most popular proponents of the humanistic perspective are Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. While Rogers focused on what could prevent people from reaching uh, self-actualization or reaching their full potential, Maslow focused on people who had reached self-actualization. Maslow is particularly known for his hierarchy, hierarchy, uh, hierarchy of needs model. In this model, Maslow proposed that in order to reach one's full potential or self-actualization, people need to meet particular needs in particular order until they reach the top of the hierarchy, which of course is self-actualization. For instance, if a person never had a lo loving and secure family or never experienced food security, 
that person would never be able to move up the hierarchy until those needs would be meet, met. He also proposed that humans have two main needs, deficiency needs and growth needs. Deficiency needs are things we need to survive, like food and safety. Once a deficiency need is sufficiently satisfied, the individual is motivated to meet the needs in the next level. In contrast, growth needs are our motivation to get better. The more we get better, the more motivated we are to continue reaching towards self-actualization. Last but not least is the trait perspective. You might be familiar with the trait perspective because they are the proponents of the widely known personality tests such as the Big Factor 5. These researchers try to categorize particular propensities or behaviors through collecting large amounts of data and performing factor analyses. Factor analyses identify patterns and responses that are closely re related with each other. For example, if I were to give you the factor happiness, variables that would underlie that factor and be strongly related to each other would be words like smiles, joy, or positivity. This perspective in particular has dominated the field of psychology for the past few decades. The way we measure personality is fairly similar to that of temperament. For instance, researchers also use behavioral measures and self-report questionnaires. However, some proponents of the psychoanalytic perspective would use Rorschach tests to measure someone's personality. In a Rorschach test, individuals would be asked to look at an abstract picture and say what they were looking at. The idea was that your personality would influence what you saw. While this approach is certainly creative, it doesn't have much validity because there's little empirical evidence to support the Rorschach test. What seems to have more of a success at capturing and measuring personality is the Big Five Personality Factors Test. Using self-report questionnaires, researchers probe how an individual falls within five big categories, openness to experiences, agreeableness, extroversion, conscientiousness, and neuroticism. These measures have shown to have predictive power, meaning that these dimensions can predict how a person might behave in a particular situation. More recently, a sixth dimension has been added to the Big Factor 5 in order to be more inclusive of cross-cultural traits. The dimension of honesty and humility measures individual differences in people's sincerity, fairness, greed avoidance, and modesty. Overall, the field of personality continues to make great strides towards understanding human behavior. Like much of the rest of the fields of psychology, researchers studying personality still debate how much the environment or context dictates a person's behavior. In class, we will discuss how stable temperament and personality seem to be.